Okay. So we have talked about uh, web advertising in the previous chapter, and we have also talked about um, um, yeah, we have also talked about um, uh, page rank, etc. So now what we will do is we will just give you a, a basic overview of how a search engine works um, uh, so that you can connect the dots of how page rank is used and uh, where uh, is the advertising coming from and all those things. Uh, probably this will take one or two lectures. Um, it will be the, the material will be rather easy, uh, but uh, it's more about giving you an overview of things. And um, in the next semester, hopefully there will be an information retrieval course offered, of which if you take, then you will learn many of these topics in much more detail. Okay. So what a search engine does is, suppose, a user needs some information. And the assumption is that the required information is present somewhere in terms of um, it's written somewhere on the web or in some document collection and things like that. Uh, not like hard copies, but in digitally. And the search engine tries to bridge this gap. So bridge this gap, how? Typically, the user expresses the information need in terms of a query, and the engine returns a list of documents, or in more modern times, by some more uh, smarter means. Okay, so, so by some kind of smarter means, like uh, directly answering the question, or there are many other uh, possibilities. Maybe I'll just uh, talk about that. Uh, in now we can work. Okay, so this um, this is basically in the, at the heart of the um, subject called information retrieval, which is essentially retrieving information uh, from unstructured data, which may be primarily text, but it can also be uh, of other forms. Now, why, when I say by some better means, um, so the trend of search has progressed a lot in the last 10, 15 years or so. Obviously, you can ask questions to a search engine now. And mostly, if the question is common enough, the engine will return you a direct short answer or will point you to a portion of a document where your answer looks like your, you, you get your answer or something like that. So that's like question answering, a part of information retrieval now. Or maybe you can also say part of NLP in a way, uh, then whether the user has to actually express the information need directly by uh, typing or uh, speaking a query, that's, uh, th this thing also has changed a lot by proactive search. So um, Google now and many other assistants nowadays, they give you uh, feeds or uh, results which you may be interested in. So basically they're trying to predict what kind of information you need. And even without you asking for them, they are trying to give you that. And that brings the, that, that, that makes the gap between searching, uh, providing search results and advertising very small. So, so all these things are very blurred now, advertising, recommending and providing search results. Uh, they're very, the, the gap between these things are very small, right? Um, obviously, recommending something or, or giving you some information, even without you asking, maybe just sometimes just helping you to do something, reminding you or uh, give, telling you the weather or giving you some news article, or it may also be advertising, uh, sending you an advertisement or something like that, which you, from which there may be some revenue generated. Okay, but uh, in this uh, chapter, we will step back and instead of looking at all these modern trends, we will try to understand the backbones of the search engine. So basically going back 25 years, um, maybe in the, the decade of 90s and look at how search engines uh, worked. And actually, 
uh, just to tell you that even now, maybe 70% of um, the important part of a search engine is still uh, around this backbone uh, and so on. So, so whatever we are going to see today is not uh, obsolete in by any means, except that uh, the fancy features and all those things will require a lot more things on top of these, which will not be part of this course. Okay, so uh, the basic um, the basic concepts of uh, information retrieval or search will be documents. So documents are essentially unit of retrieval. Uh, we are only thinking about the old school search engine screen where you are typing a query and the engine is giving you 10 documents or you know 20 documents or whatever. Okay, so, and you have to actually look through the documents to figure out whether that's what you wanted. So suppose these are the documents uh, to make the, uh, the to make the example easy to understand. What I have done is I have uh, just made them very small looking documents. So they're essentially movies, okay? And a collection is a group of documents from which we retrieve. Uh, for Google and stuff like that, the collection is all the documents in the web and maybe something more also. If you were uh, using Google on your phone, it will also show you Play Store. Uh, if it will also show you um, integrated in phone search and web search and everything. But yeah, basically the scope of your search is the collection of a group of documents. Also called the corpus. Corpus means of course dead body. So a body of texts, right? And um, so then the most basic form of search or Boolean uh, retrieval is the Boolean retrieval, where the goal uh, is given a word W, find all documents containing the word. Okay, that is the most basic Boolean retrieval or can be more complicated uh, Boolean queries like find all documents containing a word W1, but not containing the word W2, right? So you can ex express these in terms of Boolean queries. W is the Boolean query, W1 and not W2, another Boolean query and stuff like that. So obviously, I mean, if, if you're uh, any, any uh, Boolean expression rather, so if your query is Jack, then um, the, the Boolean query means you actually have to find the documents with the word Jack, and these two will be your results. Now, obviously this is what we are, we can do by just looking at it. That's very easy. But um, if you have to actually implement this in a very simple way, what you would do is you would uh, come up with a term document matrix. Now this might look similar to your shingle document matrix. Uh, this where a term is just a one shingle, right? So those are more advanced things. I mean, we are, we are actually looking at older things now. So the term document matrix a Boolean one in this case, okay, we'll have something like this, the words present and uh, columns are documents and the uh, rows are terms, right? So it's a term document matrix. And let's say this is a one zero matrix. This means whether the term is present in the document or not. So then uh, the entry word document is one. If you know, leave the word is present in the document and the terms are dimensions of the matrix. Also units of index, we'll, we'll discuss that later and the columns are uh, documents and this is called the term document matrix. Uh, by the way, a term and a word are not the same, though often every word is also treated, treated as a term, but you can actually have multiple words or some other kind of uh, entities also treated as terms. So essentially terms are units of index. We, we, will, uh, we will actually discuss that in a while. So in this uh, case, again, if we look at Boolean retrieval with the query Jack, we know that the word Jack is present in this and this, right? So all you have to do essentially is just get the row for the term Jack. So the result is basically uh, this bit vector or uh, vector of uh, Booleans, okay, one zero vector which means the ones are the documents that you want to return and zeros are the documents you don't want to return. For a bit more complicated query, let's say captain and gun, you can actually do the same, fetch the two rows, captain and gun, and then the result is an and operation of the two bit vectors. Okay, and only the first one has captain and gun both. 
Okay, so this uh, this is conceptually what Boolean retrieval could look like, uh, but um, but then if you have a huge number of documents and huge number of terms and so on, this is not really what you want to do. So what do you want to do? Um, yeah, but we'll get to that. But before that, uh, just two important concepts. Um, one is uh, the, rather the terminologies. Uh, query is clear, right? So query is given by the user and it represents the information need. Uh, now, information need is essentially what the user wants to know. And query is the representation of that need that the user conveys to the system. So suppose I am a user of a search engine and it is possible that I'm thinking about something but the query I submitted is not really uh, meaningful or not really what I am, what I want, right? So I may actually, as a user, I may not be able to translate my information need, which is in my brain, right? So I may not be able to translate that need perfectly in terms of a query, and it may not be also possible to translate. So uh, you must have had difficulties sometimes when you are searching, uh, you first tried with some kind of a query, and then you didn't find good results, and you again try some other query for the same need, right? So, so essentially the query is a representation of the need, but what do you want to serve? You want to serve the need and not the query. So the relevant document is a document that satisfies the information need as perceived by the user. That means if the user thinks that what he or she wanted, uh, he or she got that, then your, uh, then your search uh, results are, uh, you know, then, then you have done your job. That means they, then that document is relevant. So that means merely the terms being present in a document is not enough. Now, a relevant document must satisfy the actual information need, and which means that uh, whether a document for a search query is relevant or not is a human perception. It's a very human thing. It is not about whether the, it, it's not a mathematical uh, condition that if this, this is happens, then the document is relevant. Okay, so it is a human, thing, whether the user is happy. So ultimately the goal is to make the users happy. Okay. And hence uh, the performance of a search engine can be measured in terms of the relevance. So precision is what fraction of the return results are relevant. You have done precision in many other contexts with how many, uh, what fraction of the results you produced are correct, right? So here correct means relevant. So let's say given a query Q and the document D you need a judgment whether this document is relevant for this query queue to measure precision, right? And recall is, suppose for a query queue, there are total uh, 100 relevant documents or let's say 80 relevant documents, what fraction of them are returned by your system? So let for to measure recall, you, you need the following. Given a query queue, you need the set of all relevant documents such that, uh, that those documents are relevant to well, of course, measuring recall in a real scenario is much harder. Precision is much easier. You can actually, for example, given 10 results, you can go through each of them and figure out is this relevant or not, and you can actually give them yes or no kind of things. So with these uh, things, uh, having said these things, let's come back to our um, um, question of Boolean retrieval. And we, we, we looked at this term document matrix and now the question is what if the collection is large? Uh, of course, right now we are, we are talking about Boolean retrieval and we are not thinking about relevance. We are basically thinking about whether my terms are present. So we'll come to that relevance thing a bit later again. So what if the collection is large? Let's say we have 1 million document. I mean, 1 million documents is definitely not so large, right? It's not at the web scale at all, but let's say a small, document collection, but the, even that may be 1 million. And let's say around half a million distinct words or terms. Then if you have half a million times 1 million Boolean entries, even that will be kind of, you know, storing that will be like a 500 gigabytes. So even that is kind of very difficult. 
So then what we do is we know that uh, in reality, term document matrices are very sparse. Most terms are not present in most documents. So we can forget the zeros and we don't want to store the zeros. What we want is for every term, store only the documents where the term is present. Okay, so that means we need to just store the ones that we see here. And now it looks much lighter than the zero one matrix, full zero one matrix, right? So this means what we want to do is from a sparse matrix, we want to, we want to convert it into an inverted index or let's say an index first and we'll then talk about why inverted in the following way. Represent the documents by document IDs like I have said one to eight let's say there are eight documents here and then the terms okay essentially let's just go back the ship appears in one three and four so for ship I will oh and also eight probably is it yeah one three or four and eight so for ship, I will have a list one, three, four, eight. Similarly, for all the terms, I will have a list of document IDs in which the term appears. So this is actually what is called the simplest version of inverted index. Why inverted? Because, okay, anybody has a guess why this is inverted index? Okay, uh, let me explain. So a normal forward representation of a document is given a document, you can read through it and find what terms are present in it. This is the inverted representation. Given a term, you can, from this index, you can know in which document is the term present, right? So normally, uh, uh, forward representation is given a document, document to terms, and the inverted representation is terms to documents. So this is an inverted index. However, I mean, you must have seen in some books uh, an in inverted index at the end. We don't call them inverted index. We call them just index, right? So given every word in which pages that word is mentioned, right? So you have, must have seen such things. So these lists are called posting lists. And the set of terms for an index is called the vocabulary or dictionary. Why this name? Vocabulary means this search engine knows these terms. That's all it knows. Or the dictionary for the search engine, right? So uh, vocabulary or dictionary and the lists are posting lists. One posting list per term, right? So this thing is the simplified version of, a, of an inverted index. So now, uh, obviously, the next thing we'll do is um, we'll see how an inverted index can be created. So what we actually did here was obviously uh, we we looked at this and then we said, okay, let's just do this, right? But we don't actually have it in that format. We have it in uh, sorry, we have it in the format of the document has these terms. So how do we invert essentially, right? How do we invert? Uh, the documents and get the inverted index. What we will do, okay, anybody has any idea how should we invert the documents? Now, this you can directly apply things that we have done before in the course. So, can you think of how should we do this uh, from this representation? Let's say given eight documents or given many documents. How do we convert that into a representation where? For each word, I have a list of documents. Come on, I think some of you should be able to come up with some idea. Is this similar to that assignment part? Where... Yes, similar to the assignment or similar to basic map reduce right so let's just think about that so first let's describe it without the map reduce but then we'll see that that's exactly what we are doing so for each document write out pairs and you can think key value pairs right so term comma doc id so when we did when we did 
word count, we, we, we wrote term comma one because we just wanted to count how many times the word appears. But here it's not about just a count. We have to also remember or store which are the doc IDs in which the term appears. So we'll write out term comma doc IDs. If we do that, then we're going to get something like this. Ship one, captain one, jack one, and so on. And similarly, ship three, tintin three, and jack four, and so on. So then we'll group by term and then make lists. Okay, I mean, in, in uh, you can say sort by your group by your whatever. So group by term, then your captains are together, jacks are together, ships are together, and so on with their doc IDs. And now you automatically got this. So for the captain, you have these doc IDs. Some doc IDs for jack, you have one, four, and more maybe for ship. Right. So the reduce finally can do that. So this is essentially a simple application of map reduce. So what we can uh, what we can kind of uh, understand from the history of uh, search engines is basically Google required. So MapReduce, all, all of you know that uh, it originated in Google. So Google required two huge computations to be done again and again. One is obviously creating the inverted index for the search, and another is uh, computing page rank. And both of them are very MapReduce friendly, and probably that's how uh, MapReduce was developed. So, of course, this is a very uh, this is a very high level uh, view of how an inverted index is created. But now let's look at a bit more detail about a couple of options. Uh, so one is blocked uh, sort based indexing. So suppose you have uh, a lot of documents, okay? And if, if you are using MapReduce kind of a thing, we can already think of them as partitioned into collection, uh, collections into say partition uh, uh, into segments. Or if you are not thinking about MapReduce, you can think of it as you know you, you partition them yourself. Okay, so if you are actually doing on a single machine, even then this might actually help. But otherwise, if it may be already partitioned into segments because you are using a distributed file system. So then you have segments of the collection. Now what you do, you for each segment make a pass over all documents and write out the term doc ID pairs just like we did. Okay, so term doc ID pairs for each segment. The third step is again for each segment separately sort the term doc ID pairs by term, or rather group them, but do it separately. Do not kind of uh, shuffle yet. Okay, do not uh, transfer over the network yet. Okay, so do this and this. Uh, if the sort is very large, this may require an external memory sort in, in that case, but so depends on how you have say, segmented things, right? If the segments are small enough, then you can actually do the sort or grouping in memory. Okay, then separately for each segment, create the posting list for each term. So if you just think of one particular segment as your whole data set, this term doc ID pairs sorted by term will already give you uh, one one partition of the index, right? You can actually get posting lists for each segment. For each term, basically you are creating now separate, separate uh, indices. And then the fifth step is now for each term. So now what you have, if you think of this as your full map process, for each term, which is a key, you have the value, which is your list of document IDs present in this segment. So this you have created. So key and value is your posting list for every um, every term segment wise. Now you can actually merge them, right? So now you can actually go into reduce and uh, then given a term, now every list is together. So you actually merge the lists and make it one final big list. So that's one version uh, of uh, indexing, that's one possibility. And you can see that this is essentially talking about MapReduce. Uh, I mean, it, it's kind of MapReduce, uh, it's a very MapReduce friendly approach. And there is another one, uh, which is a bit more dynamic, but on the other hand, uh, this there is a little bit of, um, um, yeah, I mean, there is some disadvantage also. There's some advantage and some disadvantage. So this is single pass in memory index. Uh, so, so this works in the following way. Suppose you have a huge collection and you don't partition, okay? So suppose you have a huge collection and you keep parsing documents and you 
convert them to term doc id pairs so the this portion is still the same okay you keep passing document for each document you our convert it to term doc id pairs but now keep it in memory okay so keep the term doc id pairs in memory so do not write out it's not a map uh, which is writing it out um, now as soon as uh, okay so what what happens is after uh, you have done it for some time and uh, then you can actually invert the term doc id pairs in memory to make posting lists so let's say you have processed 10000 documents they're still in memory the term doc id pairs you can actually sort them by term now and make the posting list so then in your memory you already have an index and the if the search engine is built that way then it can already work as a service to the front end and uh, it can actually return new results so the posting lists are there in memory however you are keeping things in memory so obviously memory will get exhausted so once the me memory is exhausted then you write out the whole index to disk after sorting the posting lists and dictionary so now what you have is index for one such block written to the disk and then again you start so once you have this then again you start in memory in memory in memory and when it get exhausted write it to disk so finally what you need to do of course for different different blocks you have to merge the index uh, completely now this uh, this kind of approach is nice especially for dynamic indexing where new documents are coming up uh, or some documents are being edited and stuff like that so what you can do is you can actually um, keep the 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 volatile portion or keep the new portion of the uh, data in memory index and combine the results with the more stable in disk index in some way okay so the, the, this is kind of a bit hand waving at this point because this requires going deeper into uh, that architecture and so on so i'll i'll not go into that as of now but uh, essentially the idea is that it's enough if you understand this much that if you think if you if you keep things in memory then you can actually return results um immediately you don't have to uh, wait for the merge for the documents which are uh, being uh, parsed at that point of time yeah so basically this is the dynamic indexing part for fast access posting lists can be written into contiguous blocks and uh, because you 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 if you if you move things around in disk it actually takes a lot of time so then what you do you create the auxiliary index uh, for incremental changes and keep growing that index once uh, you can perform search in both so you can, every query acts as two search processes and then the final results can be merged uh, when the auxiliary in memory index grows significantly large you can merge it with the original one but you shouldn't do it very often so you should only call this um, once in a while kind of a thing now uh, how should the index be um, how should the index be organized so index posting lists are filed right so they are let's say they are on disk if each posting list is one file then it's easy for example every term you you point to one file and then you read the whole file you get the posting list list of documents okay that's convenient but the problem is oh sorry the problem is no operating system will hand is handle this well suppose you have several million terms then in your index you will have several million different files so no for operating systems this is actually a bad idea because they cannot handle too many files in one directory properly so of course you can you can branch them out into a folder i wise or what you can do is you can put several posting lists into one file and but not all into one file so again all into one file will mean that one huge list and any change means you have to rewrite the whole file and some some portion many many lists into one file but then overall you have several files so something like if you have total n posting lists you use root n files so you know that's kind of a good uh, trade off so these are obviously empirically figured out um, what 
uh, what are uh, good things to do in this case. Uh, now, yeah, I, I guess I'll just skip this security part uh, for you to read up and I will not ask you questions from this. Uh, so let's, um, let's come to, let, let's say that we have understood the inverted index. Now, what do you want to look at is given an inverted index or once you have prepared an inverted index, how do we process queries using that index? So we saw that for Boolean retrieval, if we have the term document matrix, we simply fetch the rows and we can do an AND or 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 whatever. We do the Boolean operation of the bit vectors. However, if you have the query gun or ocean here, then what do you do? Of course, you have to fetch the posting lists for gun and ocean and do an OR. That means do an union of the lists, right? So what you would do is you will, it will actually be a linear algorithm. So you will put a pointer at the beginning of both. The assumption here is that the posting lists are sorted in some order, maybe smaller to larger numbers. The document IDs are sorted. So then uh, one, of course, will be part of the result. Then you see that the you, you, you see one in both, so you move in both lists, right? Then the two is a smaller one. Obviously, since you are doing an union, you have to write out two. And two is a smaller one, so you will move to three. So three is again the smaller one, so you will move to four and so on. So finally, this will be your result, right? So union or intersection, whatever it is, you can actually do it in this way, right? So you keep a pointer in both lists. If Even if you have three, four lists also, that's also fine. If you keep a pointer in every list, the one where it is smaller, you move in that, okay? If the numbers are equal, for intersection, you will have to output that. For union, you have to output everything. If the numbers are equal, they are duplicates. You just out, have to output it once, okay? So essentially, if the lists are of order n size, then this algorithm, this, this merge is also linear, right? It's a linear merge. So if you are asked the question, if you have two sorted lists of size n, how long will it take to compute the intersection or union? Okay, it is also order n, right? Now, when is this Boolean retrieval uh, interesting at all? Uh, so we we will soon see that uh, Boolean retrieval is not what we are really interested in, but there are some people who are. So for example, legal uh, um, documents, okay? So, so for example, Westlaw is the largest commercial legal document search engine. Uh, lots of text data, lots of case data and so on, half a million users, million queries a day. And suppose somebody is, the, the query is cases about a host's responsibility for a, for a drunk guest. And the query would look something like this, okay? So it's, this is not for normal users to use. So these are, I, I actually don't know what these Boolean operations mean, but essentially uh, when your goal is not to get the best results, rather your goal is to get all results satisfying certain conditions, then Boolean retrieval is what you want to go for, okay? Uh, because in legal scenarios, it may not be enough to get the best result. It, you, may, you may actually need to look for all possible results. You don't want to miss out on anything. So all possible results with certain conditions um, and so on. So it's, it's less, it's, it's left less to the human perception and more to exactly what is written. So um, that's why for Boolean, uh, for uh, legal document search, Boolean retrieval is still an important point. Okay, so, so far so good for that. Uh, let me pause and ask you whether you have any, um, any clear question, I mean, any questions at this point? Obviously you may have lots of questions about how is that done? How is this done kind of things? Uh, but yeah, anyway, shoot if you have any questions. All right, so let's just tell you the summary. What we have learned is collections, documents, precision, recall, inverted index, term, document, matrix, how to create an inverted index, okay? So basically, that's these are the things I want you to remember from whatever we have covered so far. The next is ranking, and uh, we are actually covering this because some of you wanted this portion. 
So now the question is obviously Boolean retrieval models simply return documents satisfying some Boolean conditions. Now among those are all documents equally good? No, right? I mean, obviously some of them, they, they may all the terms may be present, but not all documents are equally good for the user. It's a single term query. Not all documents containing the term are equally associated with that term. So then what we do is we move from Boolean model to term weighting. Weight of a term in a document is either one or zero in a Boolean model. And we will use a more granular term weighting. Basically weight of a term in a document will represent how much the term is important in that document and vice versa. How much is this document centered around the concept that the term expresses? So the most common approach for that is the TF-IDF approach, term frequency and inver uh, inverse document frequency. Um, how important is a term in a document D? There are two basic intuitions here. One is more times a term is present in a document, more important it is. I mean, think about a long article if some term is some term appears again and again and again well that document is a lot about that term right i mean that concept so this gives rise to the measure term frequency intuition two so term frequency means how many times or some function of how many times the term appears in a document so this is for every term and every document we have a term frequency Intuition two is if a term is present in many documents, it is less important or less special, particularly to any of them. I mean, it's that kind of diluted, right? So this term is present everywhere. So that means it's not really uh, very important to any of these, right? It's a kind of diluted concept. This gives rise to document frequency. In how many documents is a term present? That is document frequency. Now, obviously, when I say how many, I mean some function of that number, how many, because directly just applying this counts is not what you're going to do. So now since if the document frequency increases, the importance of the term decreases, we'll, we would like to take the inverse of the document frequency. So that's why it's called IDF. Now we'll combine the two term frequency and inverse document frequency. Now, obviously you can simply take the number of times a term appears in a document divided by the number of documents in which that term appears as the TF-IDF of that term in a document and place that as the weight instead of your one zero, place that as the weight for that term in the, in the document or in the matrix or whatever. Right, so that's the simplest way, but that's not such a good idea. So then there are many variants exist for both term frequency and document frequency. And let me tell you here, that that's something we'll not cover in this uh, lecture or in this course, but should be there in a proper information retrieval course that uh, not only TF and IDF, there are other term weighting, more advanced term weighting approaches also. Uh, in a recent uh, talk, um, one of our ex-students who, who, who is a faculty in IIT Kharagpur now, uh, he mentioned he actually worked in the, the, this term, term waiting a lot during his PhD. So he mentioned that even now, 70%, uh, so the Google definitely does a ranking, right? So when you search for a query, the documents are coming, the first result, second result, so on. So even now, 70% of, on an average, 70% weightage is given to the term, uh, TF idea for this kind of term document waiting. So there are many other things, right? So we'll, we'll see some of the other things already uh, in this, uh, this, this, this lecture and next lecture. But just, so basically the point is, this is still a very important part of any search engine ranking. So not to be ignored. Okay, so let's look at one uh, a good variant of TF-IDF. So how do we model term frequency? Uh, the simplest one is the number of times T occurs in D. That is the frequency of TD. Uh, you can think of that as TF of TD. But then the problem is if a term A is present 10 times, B is present two times, is A five times more important than B in that document? Okay, that sounds a bit harsh. I mean, five times is too harsh. What about 
some term is present 20 times and some other term is present two times 10 times more you know that's too much right in a for a ranking scenario so then what you can do is you can actually logarithmically scale it one plus log of this why one plus because if it is present once then log of that will be zero so you, that's you, you don't want a zero there right so one plus log is basically uh, one possibility still the problem is suppose uh, there is a small document talking about some topic and there is a huge article about it uh, some user may not actually want to look at that huge article so it's not necessarily true that a long document should get uh, more preference but if you simply look at the frequency then long documents are going to get more preferences right i mean uh, similar documents term may will be present five times in a short document and 50 times in a long document so that's not such a good idea right so uh, then what you do is augmented frequency avoid bias towards longer document and this could be one possible formula half plus in the numerator half times frequency the frequency we talked about divided by this maximum frequency of any word in the document so obviously for long documents um, the maximum frequency of any word in the document will also be high so essentially you are taking a relative frequency of this particular term in this document so the idea behind this formula is if a term is present in a document give it some score okay just being present give it some score okay that's the consolation prize to start with now so to to get more score rest is a function of the frequency or relative frequency okay so this can be a bit more complicated but a bit better uh, modeling of the intuition that term frequency or tf comes up with similarly uh, inverse document frequency how do you model so the most basic idea is uh, so never never you do one by df uh, the most usually what people do is uh, the simple simpler version is this n if n is the total number of documents then log of n by df again the same thing so there are some words which are present in millions of documents and some words which are present only in thousands of documents then just dividing by the document frequency will penalize the frequent words too much so you dampen it by a log factor right so you would take log of n by df uh, yeah and this is just an insight that uh, uh, is obtained from most document collections what happens is typically uh, this is called a ziff's law if you order the terms in term in terms of their uh, document frequency that means the first term is the most frequent term in the whole collection the second term is the second most frequent term in the whole collection and so on then what happens is the df of ith term is kind of proportional to one by i or rather it, the formula actually looks something like this if you draw a graph it will become something like this so the the the, the curved non-straight line one, one is the real uh, data the most frequent most frequent is the zero that means log 10 rank right so the first one uh, the the frequency now the document frequency is this and so on so on so on and then you know here you have let's say 10 to the power so thousandth term uh, the document frequency is around 10 to the power you know 4.5 or whatever so it basically uh, this is for one particular document collection one can see that this is what happens so yeah so what is tfidf then tfidf is essentially a function from text data uh, pretty much the a function of modeling this intuition that a more times a term is present in a document it should get more weightage and a more number of documents a term is present in that term should get less weightage right so this is um, yeah i mean tfid is essentially taking this approach there are more and more sophisticated formulas the ones i described here are decent ones given these things i will actually finish with vector space model basic idea of vector space model today maybe we will finish at 120 um, given these things now um, let's say one can move from uh, 
the term document Boolean matrix to a vector space model. Now, this is a conceptual model. In practice, of course, they'll be inverted indices, but this is a conceptual model where every term represents a dimension. Every document is a vector in the term space. The term document matrix is a still a very sparse matrix. However, the entries are scores of the terms in the documents, maybe TF-IDF score, maybe some other even nicer score. So we started with Boolean, the most, then the naive way would have been count and then it will be some weight. Now, obviously, uh, the, it, the weights may not be so nice to look at, but yeah, some, some weight uh, of mm, the term and the document. And then what will happen is the query is also a vector in the term space. So suppose the query is India statistical or India statistics or something like that. Okay, so query is this. And uh, then the vector similarity can be computed by, we already know clustering and many other things. Uh, so similarity of vectors or sim uh, distance of vectors, right? So we know it should be some form of inverse of distance, you know, opposite of distance in some way. So let's say, uh, what kind of distance will be good? Will Euclidean distance be good? So essentially what we are, uh, the, 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 the takeaway message from this slide is, Every document is a vector based on the terms which it con consists of. Every query is also a vector. The terms you are writing in the query are the uh, terms of the uh, vector. Now, in this case, I have written just one and one here in the simple form. That means if I write India statistical, both terms present only once, I'm just writing one, one. But uh, in reality, uh, there may be term weighting for queries also. So this vector also may not actually be a uh, one, 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 zero kind of a vector. It may also have <laughs> different weights. So, but then how would you compute the similarity between a query and the documents? And then your final idea is given the query, uh, rank the documents in terms of similarity with the query. The most similar document to the query should be my first ranked document. That should come up in the first in the search result and so on, right? So will Euclidean distance be good? Not really, because there will be a problem. So suppose we have two terms, term one and term two. I already said the, the, the documents and queries are vectors in the space, right? So let's say in projected into this uh, plane, the term one and term two, these are the two documents, let's say D1 and D2. So D1 is more towards term one, D1, D2 is more towards term two. Now what about D3? D3 is also more towards term three. However, if you look at the Euclidean distance, then the problem is, okay, so scenario is that topic wise, D3 and D1 look more similar to term one, right? Okay, however, Euclidean distance wise, because D3 is so long, okay, because the magnitude is so long for the vector, Euclidean distance wise, these two are close, but D3 is far apart from both of them. So that's actually, uh, not really a good idea. However, we can do dot product to solve this problem to some extent. So let's try dot product first. Okay, so again, let's try dot product here. So the, if we do dot product, then similarity of a query and a document will be given by simply Q transpose D. Okay, so if we do Q transpose D, we'll get something like this here. I mean, yeah. The problem with dot product is, however, we can draw another example. Suppose D1 and D2 are something like this. They're very close, okay? Two documents very similar, but they're very short. And then D3 is very large. So dot product actually gets influenced by the norm. So topic wise D2 and D1 are close, closer to each other than D3, but D3 will have higher dot product with D1 than D1 will have with D2, right? So the dot product of D1, D2 will be smaller than dot product of let's say D1 and D3. So that's again another problem with dot product. So then finally, the solution would be consider the angle, cosine of the angle between the two vectors. If they're exactly same direction, angle is zero, cosine is one. If they're perpendicular to each other, orthogonal, angle is 90, ortho, and then the cosine is zero. And if they're opposite direction, cosine will be minus one, right? So uh, cosine similarity is actually, um, it's dot product divided by norm, right? So this is actually one of the um, one of the most common 
practices when people use tfidf kind of uh, tfidf kind of term weighting then often they tend to go for some kind of cosine similarity measure now this you can also do cosine similarity measure for clustering for example um, and so on now obviously uh, the, that, that will not be a euclidean uh, space but uh, it will nevertheless give you a, a similarity measure um, okay so we'll i think we'll 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 come to the rest of uh, rest of this in the next class uh, as of now is there any question okay so uh, if there is no question i guess you know things are very easy here so that's fine um we'll cover uh, this in in another class the rest of the things that i wanted to do and then we will as usual have one quiz on the wave advertising and uh, the search thing probably these will be the easier portion of uh, the course all right so let me stop oh, the so just one question yes yes please so go on just one huh. Sir, um, uh, so Google, what uh, it does is, so um, for vocabulary, for each term, it already calculates TF-IDF for each vocabulary. Okay. For each term. So, so, so we, we, we showed creation of inverted index and there we said just the term and list of document IDs. Right. But in reality, it will not be just a term and list of document IDs. It will be the term and the list of document IDs, but with every document ID, you should also have the score. So that this is calculated beforehand. This is your pre-processing at indexing time. You must calculate whatever TFIDA for some other score for the term and that document, and you should put that into the posting list. So the posting. Uh, uh, list, so yeah. So, um, um, so uh, the in vocabulary, Google's vocabulary, each term uh, uh, has uh, already pre-calculated its uh, TFIDF. So TFIDF is not it's already pre not specific to a term. Yeah. TFIDF is specific to a term and a document. Uh, it's uh, okay. Right. So uh, if you just think about this, so, I mean, from from here also you can see. So see, Diwali is a term. Okay, India, India is a term. The TFIDF, I mean, let's assume these are the TFIDF scores. For India, TFIDF, the index should look like D1, 0 0.2, D4, 0 0.2, D5, 0 0.4. Okay. It already calculates for all terms and the documents in which the term is present, the TFIDF scores. Okay. Okay. So your index essentially. Uh, let me just try to show you uh, just a moment. Let me actually uh, let me let me show you one. Maybe maybe somewhere we have that slide. So I'll just uh, just a moment. I'll just oh no no not really. But anyway, let me show you from here. Maybe I'll create one slide like that and then before the next class. So essentially what you will have is you will have the ship, then the document ID and the score and more things. Not only this, we will come to those things. So, 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 and more things for some other reason, but term doc ID score term, and then again, doc ID score, doc ID score, doc ID score like that. Okay. So when you then compute this intersection or union or whatever, you will also be able to merge the scores. All right. So I, we will come to that in the next class when we do query processing. Okay. So in the next class, we'll actually take up take up query processing, and uh, we'll we'll see exactly how that uh, searching works. Okay. Okay. All right. So let me yeah stop recording.